Hey, hello there, everyone, and welcome to today's District Administration Web Seminar. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Isaac Durley. I'm the magazine's Web Seminar Editor, and I'll be your moderator. The title of today's event, as here, is Three Proven Intervention and Remediation Strategies for Effective Instruction, and is being brought to you free of charge through the generous support of our sponsor, McGraw-Hill Education. First, people are still coming in here, a bit of background about our topic that we'll be discussing here today. District leaders are challenged with developing whole school data-driven prevention-based frameworks for improving learning outcomes for every student. Under the new provisions of ESSA, district leaders are also mandated to build curriculum capacity using a layered continuum of evidence-based practices and systems to improve outcomes for students in tiers two and three and special education. Today, we're joined by a team of leading academic experts who will be discussing three proven strategies for ensuring that district instruction supports and motivates at risk and struggling students and meets these mandates by helping teachers to proactively implement intervention and remediation in the classroom. We look forward to a very interesting presentation and discussion here, as well as live Q&A. So do soon. We're going to get started in just a minute or two here. Before we do, just some brief housekeeping here. If you're having any trouble listening through your computer speakers, or if you prefer listen over the telephone, uh, you may have noticed we just posted the phone number and access code in the chat panel that you should see at the middle right margin of your screen there. Uh, and dial those to get access over the phone if needed. And speaking of which, you can also use that chat panel if you're having any technical problems. Uh, send a message to our host and producer. Her name is Ashley Morgan. Just use her name there if you uh, have any problems. She'll help you out. If you have a question for our speakers, please feel free to use the Q&A panel at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen there. Uh, uh, feel free to ask a que question at any time as we're going here. We'll answer as many as possible when we get to the Q&A at the end of our here. Uh, so once again, if you have a question for our speakers today, chip it in that Q&A box that you should see in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen there. Also, we'll make the slide deck available if you want to download and the archive recording Today's presentation will also be available. If you review it, go back over it at your own pace, or if you want to share uh, with anyone on your team, asterisk. But I'll tell you more about that a little bit later on. So with that, on our program today, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Vicki Ginn. She is a speaker, consultant, and trainer, and also a McGraw-Hill education author. Also with us, Nancy Marchand Martella. She is professor of special education at the University of Oklahoma. And with her there is Ron Martella, who is also a professor of special education, also at the University of Oklahoma. And Nancy and Ron are, are both also uh, McGraw Hill education authors. So uh, with that, Ron is going to start us off today. So I'll turn it over to him at this point. Ron, it's great to have you with us. Welcome to Web Seminar. Thank you, Ron. Um, as a Kurt, I'm Ron Martello. I wanted to um, discuss briefly on, about positive academic and behavior support. And it's ironic that uh, an article just came out in the American Educator in the fall of 2016, 
in the Share My Lesson team um, section called Reinforcing Positive Behavior. So this is a, a timely topic and one that we uh, shall be taking a look at. There's another major issue is with instruction and in, uh, with instruction and behavior management. And essentially, there's some is going on with regard to how we interact with our students. And presently, teachers consider the classroom management to be the most difficult aspect of their jobs. And in fact, if you look at the data, around 50% of new and urban teachers leave the profession within the first five years due to difficulties dealing with the management issues. This is a very, very important topic. And I wanted to talk about how we look at behavior management and how we interact with the students and how that leads to uh, improved behavior. Fortunately, what we do overall in classrooms tend to not help the situation, but can make the situations worse. Uh, essentially, when we look again at what goes on in major, many classrooms, there's high rates of negative interactions between students who exhibit problems and their teachers. In fact, over percent of all appropriate behaviors tend to be unrecognized. Behaviors that do tend to get recognized are those behaviors um, that uh, are ones that we don't want to see occurring in our classrooms. So teachers are five times more likely to recognize inappropriate behaviors as compared to appropriate behaviors. And so what we see with teachers in the classroom is that a lot of negative scanning going on, trying to catch kids who are not following the rules versus positive scanning, looking for students who are behaving appropriately. And this is a, a significant issue. So needed is we really need to create a reinforcing learning environment. And there was a major meta-analysis conducted back in 2003. And if we look at the most effective, least cost behavior management procedure, it would be this, to be able to uh, develop positive relationships uh, among the students and between the teacher and the students. The analysis was conducted with over 100 studies. And what Mano Marzano found was that you have a 31% fewer discipline problem and real violations for teachers who had positive relationships with their students. So what is a positive relationship? That's how we interact with our students. And we can get it down to the nitty gritty, which is the ratio of positives to negatives. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So the goal really is overall to have around a three to four to one, up to five to one ratio of positives to negatives. Actions. I want to point out where this five to one comes from. It's nothing that was just put the air. It's from really the uh, counseling literature. When counselors did research on, on effective relationships, especially effective marital relationships, they found that if you hit a ratio of five positives to every one negative interaction with another individual, we tend to develop really positive relationships. They extended that research into child rearing. So effective parents were parents who had a positive uh, ratio compared to negatives in terms of interactions with their students. So the goal there with counselors is what they found was a five to one ratio was something that we really need to look at in terms of developing positive relationships with each other. Now, when we look at what teachers do in classrooms, the average ratios of teachers who work with students with behavior problems is about one to two to one to four positive to negative interaction. So it really is risk of what, what we should be seeing in the classroom. This is with uh, students with behavior problems, and that provides us with a significant issue when to display uh, problem behaviors, and that is that it tends to actually escalate their problem behaviors. Now, interestingly, Ranke et al. in 2013 came out with a study, and they said even teachers who are involved in a school-wide uh, behavior program, an WPBIS program, it's only about a one to two to one ratio of positives to negatives. Now, these are teachers who have been trained, specifically trained on developing positive relationships with, with their students. And in the Ricky et al. study, they found in a sample of 33 teachers, only one achieved a ratio of four to one. So this is something that we really need to work toward uh, in our classrooms, and that is increasing the amount of positive um, uh, interactions to negative interactions. Also, uh, Rank indicated that teachers who report using harsher responses to student discipline problems and lower rates of positives to negatives 
Also, higher levels of emotional exhaustion. So the more we tend to interact negatively with our students, it actually causes issues with our health in terms of emotional output. So all versus reality is that we really use a negative, what I would call a negative reinforcement paradigm in our schools and in our classrooms. In other words, most of the reinforcement between students and uh, with emotional and behavioral disorders and their teachers represents negative reinforcement. Before we move on, I want to, want to de define our terms here briefly, and I'm going to contrast two different approaches to motivation for students. One is we call positive reinforcement and the second negative reinforcement. And positive reinforcement means that we are providing something, there's a stimulus that comes after a particular behavior, and that, as a result, increases the future likelihood of that behavior. Now, in this definition, a positive reinforcer doesn't mean reward necessarily. A positive reinforcer is something that absolutely increases the behavior in the future. Reinforcement, on the other hand, is not the same as punishment. Negative reinforcement is where we remove something that is aversive. To, and if the student behaves in a certain manner, then we remove that uh, a particular negative reinforcer. So that increases the future likelihood of a behavior in order to escape or avoid uh, an aversive stimulus. And I'll talk about that more here in a second. Now, it's going to make a distinction between the two because, again, we can, we can motivate students one of two ways, through positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. And there is a difference. And back to the research in the 1960s, we found that we can teach individuals if we teach individuals through a negative reinforcement paradigm, it actually tends or it can tend to slow down learning or make learning more difficult to occur. So the model I wanted to present briefly how we can distinguish between the two. In a pre-enforcement paradigm, which is the graphic on the top there, we have a flat line which is no behavior. And let's say a student answers a question for us, and after that receives a reinforcer, in this case, praise. Now, inside that box, other behaviors can occur, and we'll term those behaviors interfering behaviors. The behaviors that may, for a period of time, slow down or at least uh, prevent the next answer to the question. But notice any of those behaviors that are occurring within that box after we receive praise occurs after the student answers the question correctly. On the other with negative reinforcement, we have a threat of a bad grade, and that's what our reverse of stimulus is. So we have a threat of a bad grade, you answer this question correctly, or I'm going to give you a bad grade, I'll give you an F. A uh, student then has to answer that question correctly in order to avoid that threat of a bad grade. So negative reinforcer comes then as a result of removing the threat of the bad grade if the student answers the question correctly. Unfortunately, what happens when we engage in this type of paradigm is we have behavior that can occur during that uh, threat of a bad grade. Again, these are called interfering behaviors, and behaviors would occur in that box. Now, one thing is if you consider those behaviors, those interfering behaviors that occur inside that box, those interfering behaviors come before answering that question correctly. This is where we see students who have emotional responses, they break down and they cry, or students go blank, uh, they can't remember the answer to the question. And those interfering behaviors would be things like stress or nervousness or something like that. So again, I can motivate students to learn one of two ways through positive reinforcement that if the student works hard, the student can achieve something um, positive in the future, or I motivate behaviors by giving threats and warnings that if a student doesn't engage in a certain behavior, then something bad is going to happen, and that motivates a student to work harder. Um, fortunately, based on the data we see in classrooms, many classrooms, we see a uh, ladder. Uh, we see that uh, teachers tend to use more negative reinforcement as of motivational systems where we have threats or warnings. And again, that just uh, escalates problem behaviors and makes learning more, more difficult to occur. So the real challenge then is, can bring back into the research, is that exposure to coercive control, and this would be considered coercive control using a negative reinforcement paradigm, has been not to improve school outcomes associated with higher rates of school dropout and lower academic performance. And this is where I tie this into academics, is the more negative we are with the kids, those ratios are lower in terms of positives to negatives, and to get lower academic 
performance and more behavior issues. Also, according to Bijou in 1988, research has shown that the most effective way to reduce problem behavior in children is to fit desirable behavior through positive reinforcement rather than trying to weaken the undesirable through versus or negative processes. So again, this is something that uh, we've discussed over the years and something that we're seeing in the classrooms that, that we really need to take a look at. Now, how does this relate to uh, effective instructional procedures? Well, it does because the way we instruct our students and motivate our students to learn is also related to how we um, uh, uh, student behavior. So typically, look at these as two separate issues, but I look at the positives to negatives ratio only in terms of behavior management. I look at it in terms of effective instruction. And we know that effective teachers are more positive with their students than negative with their students. In other words, the more positive means of motivating their students than aversive means or negative reinforcement types of processes. So we're together there that the more positive we are with our kids, the better able we are to provide effective instruction procedures and effective behavior management procedures make our interactions more explicit, or more positive, sorry. One, explicitly teach and encourage classroom-wide expectations, and this academically and behaviorally. So explicitly teach classroom routines, and third, we aim for a three to five positive to one negative adult-student interactions. Again, if we're at the biggest bang for our buck in terms of behavior management, this is where we would go and that is establishing positive relationships with our students. Four, engage in active supervision with positive versus negative scanning. No trying to catch kids being good versus catching kids who are um, violating our expectations or our rules in our classroom and school. Five, precision requests for minor and frequent behavior errors versus warnings and threats. So the more we get into warnings and threats, more, the more we're using negative reinforcement types of procedures to motivate students to behave appropriately. It's much better to provide a precision request, essentially it's a redirect, that we're telling students, here's what you need to do. And if the student doesn't do it, continues to misbehave, then the student suffers the consequence after that point. But we tend to decrease the probability that students are going to continue to misbehave when we provide a redirect or a precision request, as opposed to providing threats and warnings, especially for students who have severe behavior issues. Next, preventative strategies such as pre-corrections, preaching for chronic errors. We can we can predict what behaviors the students are going to occur or exhibit in certain situations. We have steps to try to prevent those behaviors from occurring in the first place by teaching those expectations and rules and routines and so on. And finally, we want to ensure that curriculum is matched to students so to avoid uh, issues with students attempting to. Uh, escape or avoid academic tasks because those tasks are aversive to them. So, ways for this presentation would be these four things. First, we need more positive in our classroom with our students. So we really need to motivate through positive versus negative reinforcement. Third, the goal is to reach a three to five to one positive to negative ratio, and that is really not easy to do with teachers. It's difficult to do, but it's something that we really need to try to work toward. And finally, we integrate academic and behavior management strategies, first and foremost, build those positive relationships with our students, both behaviorally and academically. Thank you. The next presentation um, is explicit instruction, the key to effective differentiated instruction, and I'm Nancy Marchand Martella. I'm happy to be here. Ron really did a uh, nice framework for us um, with regard to uh, positive aspects of um, ensuring a positive classroom atmosphere and so forth. And now it's a nice uh, segue into um, talking about effective instructional um, techniques. So um, what we first need to do is to make sure that we have a clear idea about two definitions, that being differentiated instruction, and then secondly, we're going to talk about explicit instruction. The um, definition of differentiated instruction differs slightly depending on um, who you read, and I provided 
Dean and Hasbro because Vicki's going to be coming up next. Um, she's got a great definition of teaching differently or changing how instruction and practice occur in schools to enhance student learning. And then the Tomlinson and Allen book, um, Attending to the Learning Needs of Our Students with the Goal of Maximizing Student Success. We've got the definition of explicit instruction. And my favorite um, book on explicit instruction is by um, Anita Archer and Charlie Hughes. I'd highly recommend taking a look at that. And that book's on explicit instruction. And the definition is unambiguous, direct approach to teaching, characterized by, by clear scaffolding. And by scaffolding, I'm talking about um, explanations and model demonstrations of instruction. But the key here is that there's practice, and the practice includes student feedback. And then until student mastery has been achieved. So that's the definition um, that we're going to take forward. So we achieve differentiated instruction using explicit instruction. And we need to think about starting where the learner is, but our ultimate goal is going to be that we want the students to be independent so we're moving from more of a teacher-controlled kind of situation where the teacher's taking responsibility and we're starting to release over time um, the level of responsibility to where the students are doing the work on their own. And so in, in order to more effectively do that when we're looking at differentiated instruction, that means that we need to look at programs that involve placement testing, so a, a placement test to help put the students into that level of a program, for example grouping to ensure that the, the groups are relatively homogeneous, um, prerequisite skills instruction to ensure that students have the right skills to move forward it to complete more complex kind of activities. And um, we want to ensure that the programs we use are validated, validated instructional programs that have been shown to work with students. The, a pretty nice meta-analysis um, done by Hattie in 2009, and um, this is a, a nice slide that I got from colleagues at my Blissey in the state of Michigan, and it's really um, taking a look at two sides of this whole um, uh, event in terms of explicit instruction and discovery-based instruction, and the effect sizes are there. You can see clear differences, but what I want to really point out is that when you've got learners who have a very limited background with regard to knowledge and skills, then you want to be much more intentional with your instruction, and that's explicit instruction. If the learner, for example, has a history of difficulty in terms of learning, explicit instruction, those approaches work better for kids. Now, if you have learners who have substantial background in, of knowledge and skills, then you can move into much more inquiry-based and problem-based types of approaches all those students who have a history of academic success. But really the way to look at this is more of a continuum, and that being that when students don't have the skills, you're much more explicit. But students gather those skills, they start to move into much more problem-based or inquiry-based kinds of learning um, approaches. So it's important to remember it's not an if we use one or not, but a when. The model that um, I really like to look at with regard to effective instruction, particularly in differentiated instruction, is what's called a gradual release of responsibility model. And that model includes the following elements. A, a model, you saw that clearly in the definition of explicit instruction. It also includes a guide. And um, I'll go through each one of these elements as we move forward. And guide is clearly one where there's feedback provided to the student. There's a monitor, and that's where this, the, um, for example, teacher, or, or it could be computer is monitoring student performance where the student is doing it on his or her own. Our mastery checks to ensure that the skill has actually been um, acquired. And then anytime something's learned, it should be folded into a review activity. And um, the, the best way of looking at this is um, what I would refer to as the I do, we do, you do approach. And again, a great book on, um, if you know more about I do, we do, you do, would be the explicit instructional um, book by Archer and Hughes. So these are called the three do it. And the three do it's, again, are I do it, we do, you do it. If the students are participating on um, a computerized um, 
let's say, computerized literacy program, the computer could lead the students through carefully modeling and showing students how to do something. Um, or, for example, if the teacher is teaching a new strategy, the teacher would show and explain the strategy to the students. And then following that I do it with, with the explanations and modeling, the teacher would um, lead the students through the we do it where the skill is broken down into parts. The students are starting to perform the skill, they are receiving feedback for perform right way, and if they make mistakes, then that's an opportunity to receive an error correction, which would be, here's how you do it, now show me how to do it. And additional practice ensues. And again, that could be done on the computer as well, where the computer has elements that walk students through, and if students respond correctly, then they continue on to further examples. And then you do it, and that's where um, the release has now taken place for the student doing it on his or her own. And um, if students are performing at a high level, that's when over time, uh, uh, based on a certain number correct, for example, then that can go into um, a review cycle. Now, about this with regard to student learning, um, and the, the stairs, I think, is a nice analogy that when we have students who are struggling and they don't have the prerequisite skills to be able to perform higher level tasks, that we make sure that for them, the lower um, level stairs are there because if you want them to be at the top of the stairwell, but they don't have the prerequisites to be there, that we have to ensure that they can actually make it in a successful um, fashion. So the stairs on the left start off at, at smaller levels, and as students become successful on those prerequisite skills, they continue to move up in a very positive fashion, and that's much more of an errorless learning paradigm. We don't want students to make mistakes, so we're carefully going to walk them up the stairwell, and as they reach each step, they're successful, then they move next. Whereas the stairwell on the right would make an assumption that, you know, um, hey, just jump up to this next stair, but a lot of our students, that gap between the ground and that first stair is too great. That's where we get a lot of frustration, students getting up, and forth. So the, the key here is that we want to ensure that students are successful, that prerequisites are established before we move up. That's why you look at programs that offer a careful scope and sequence. Uh, prerequisites have to be build, uh, built before we can uh, move into more advanced skills. And um, you take a look at scope and sequences that will do what's called a vertical analysis where you look at lesson one and we've got light blue and dark blue, that might indicate what type of skills are being taught. And you can see, you know, more and more practice happens, skills are building and so forth over time. So uh, you want to ensure that before you use a program, one thing to take a careful look at would be what's this, the program scope and sequence and um, are those the kinds of skills that you want your students to learn? What's been very, very popular is the multi-tiered system of supports, and that really is, if you're familiar with RTI, response to intervention, takes the RTI um, uh, movement and moves it up into uh, the next level. And now this is what states are really taking a look at. The MTSS, multi-tiered system of supports, not only talks about instruction, but it talks about what Ron talked about, and that was, the whole behavior um, element as well. So instruction is not just setting up what we're going to do in our core supplemental and intensive intervention kinds of, of programs, but we also need to talk about, for example, school-wide rules and classroom-based rules and individualized kinds of um, approach that we're going to use with kids in terms of behavior. So with regard to um, uh, explicit instruction, differentiated instruction, tier one is course, the general ed core program. What happens here is that we've got screening that's happening, we've got progress monitoring that's happening, and we make decisions about how students perform in Tier 1 as to if they need Tier 2 or strategic intervention. And that's an additional typically 20 to 30 minutes of um, instruction. And as I've talked about, to provide much more differentiated instruction, a key aspect of Tier 2 would be to be much more intentional and explicit in the time of instruction that's provided. 
If students are struggling in Tier 2, then we could look at uh, Tier 3, which is an intensive intervention. We could also look at a Tier 4 model. And to be honest with you, I really like Tier 4 models uh, more because Tier 3 is an additional way of becoming even more intentional. It would be where we have maybe an even uh, smaller group, more time, focused work on um, the difficulties at hand. And again, if that doesn't work, if we are not seeing increases in performance, then we move down the road of um, looking at a potential referral for special education. But as we're moving through this, we're looking at careful differentiated instruction and explicit instruction. An example of a research validated program is early interventions in reading. Um, it would certainly be a program that you could use, for example, at a tier two or tier three level. Um, it's got the words that one would say, a teacher would say on the left, but this is very intentional. It involves the prerequisites of uh, you need to know individual sounds. One individual sounds, and you can start to blend those sounds to form words in terms of sounding it out and saying it fast. But this is an explicit instructional program because there was clear modeling, there's clear guided practice where the students receive feedback, both uh, corrective and positive feedback, and then the students then do things on their own. There's lots of group or individual practice. So anyways, with regard to uh, my portion of the presentation, um, first and foremost is differentiated instruction that we do need to attend to the learning needs of our students to ensure instructional success. That a very effective way of doing this is to follow, follow the um, explicit instructional model. I do it, we do it, you do it. Again, I show you or the computer provides um, careful um, link that we do it where there's practice with careful observation and feedback, and then you do it where the students do it on their own. And of course, that's a gradual release model, which is the third bullet, where we're going to gradually release the level of responsibility from teacher to student or from uh, the computer taking ownership to the student. And then finally, in order to meet the multi tiered system of supports, we need to um, really include the, the um, aspects of explicit instruction in order to make MTSS uh, much more effective. Thank you. Hi, this is Vicki Gibson, and I'm going to make a suggestion that effective instruction with explicit feedback provides the point of need is an intervention, and it's certainly considered and prevention and pre-K through kindergarten for both Tier 1 and Tier 2 intervention. The problem is, is how do we make that happen in classrooms? And of course, the most effective instruction for the last four decades in the research has been small group teacher-led instruction, but it's a management issue. When you look at the uh, report recently by the National Council of Teacher Quality in 2014, a report uh, was a survey of teacher prep programs, and less than 3% of the teacher prep program teaches classroom management. And so the first question I like to ask administrators is, how are your teachers providing high-quality instruction and feedback to prepare students to achieve the outcomes in any state standard, especially if there's the 46 states that has adopted the more rigorous common core state standard. However, Texas, Indiana, and Oklahoma all have increased the level of rigor. But when I visit schools and talk with administrators, I like to ask, if to walk through the corridors of any of your schools, how many classrooms or classroom teachers would I see working with every student every day in small group for at least 15 minutes. And it's rare that I get a response that we see that, except maybe possibly in kindergarten and first grade. And I think that it's going to be extremely difficult to implement the, any of these state standards, especially for speaking and listening and the language standards, if we're not working in small groups. 
So what I've seen in schools across the country is a large amount of their resources, time, and money that's been spent on unpacking the standards, but clarifying the impact of the outcomes in the state standard on teaching, student practice, and assessment. And the design of these standards are is extremely different. And so I think that I would highly encourage as, as an intervention is to begin to inform administrators and teachers about the changes that are in the standards and their impact on practice and classrooms. And look at those changes or instructional shifts because mastery is no longer required in every grade level as it has been done in the past. And in fact, we treated standards or the outcomes and standards in the past as objectives. And the habit of our teachers is to teach six or nine weeks and test for mastery, and then teach for six or nine weeks and test for mastery. And that is not the design of the current standards. In fact, most of the standards require progress monitoring of the student's performance toward the goal. And then if mastery is required to be assessed, then it's assessed at the end of the year, which is the reason that we have new assessments forthcoming, including uh, report cards that will now monitor and report more progress monitoring toward the goal rather than assessing and reporting mastery as we have done in the past. So understanding those outcomes is incredibly uh, important if you're going to differentiate instruction. Now I'm going to define differentiate instruction just slightly different than um, Nate was mentioning. It, is, it means to teach differently, but I see differentiating instruction as the behavior of teaching. We changed everything in the schools in the past 10 to 20 years. The length of the day, assessments, curriculum, outcomes, standards, objectives, you name it. But what's not really seen a significant change is, is the way that content is delivered. We're not seeing the behavior of teaching and classroom practice change in many schools. And what differentiating instruction means is teaching differently. And that's different from differentiating content. That's when you adjust the level of the content with a leveled reader or you shorten the story. That's differentiating content. When you differentiate practice, you change the activity. But when you differentiate teaching, you're thinking about what the teacher does in response to students response to instruction, which is the first RTI. Most of us have been introduced to RTI's response to intervention. What comes before response to intervention is response to instruction. Closely monitoring if the student is understanding what is being said and done, how they are expected to apply that. And when you monitor the student's response to instruction, closely, then you will automatically adjust or change the behavior of teaching and give immediate feedback based on what you're observing. So it's like the teacher is working with a group of small students, delivering instruction, closely monitoring the student's behavior, responding to questions, determining if the students are understanding what is taught, and if not, then immediately giving feedback to, to clarify the issues. So teaching behavior changes. So how are we going to get teaching behavior to change? I think that we need to update our knowledge base about the outcomes and the standards. I'm going to show you a quick way to do that that's free and available on the Gibson Hasbrook website. And then I think we need to get informed about what evidence-based practice are, not just research-based, because Everything is research-based these days, but in space, that that practice or that procedure or that idea has hard evidence of effectiveness with the same kinds of demographics of the students in which you intend to use this change or this practice. And I think that I'm recommending some books here. One is Visible Learning, obviously John Hattie's work in 2009. Also looking at Fullen's work, Fullen and Clinton. 
the book carrots, talking about the uh, need for schools to basically develop the uh, internal capacity to have consistent expectations that are clearly explained so that everyone is working as a team toward common goals. And then I think one of the best resources in terms of looking at uh, reading instruction and the research is certainly David Kilpatrick's book, Essentials of Assessing, Preventing, and Overcoming Reading Disabilities. So I think a couple of things is that I think are very strong interventions. One is going to be definitely getting informed. That would be informing the administrators, informing the teachers, or any other professional that's working with students within schools and across districts, that we inform not only our knowledge base about what best practice is, but also how do we determine what those outcomes and those standards are meaning in terms of the changes to teaching student practice and assessment. So I think if you look at the search, basically it just says have an unrelenting focus with intentional learning outcomes. In other words, determine what works and then work as a team toward it. And then build that internal capacity by forming the leaders. And that would include your school board, including parents, community members, anyone that has an impact on school leadership or school decision making. I think that the research has been very clear that teacher-student relationships is a primary predictor in student success, especially if you again look at Hattie's work where teacher efficacy and students trust that that teacher one knows the content, two can deliver it, and three will answer their questions. That's a powerful incentive to reduce behavior problems and increase student participation so that they ask questions for clarification. I think that having very purposeful and coherent instruction with feedback, and I like to define explicit instruction as instruction that begins with a clear understanding of what a student can do and pacing that will be most effective for that student, looking both at their prerequisite skill of what they do know and then certainly knowing the outcome of what they're expected to know or to learn and be able to do, and then structuring a um, learning progression, if you will, again, looking at Hess's work, can Hess's work on learning progression, of what, uh, how fast you can uh, work with those students so that they do uh, learn with comprehension and they're not frustrated. And small group instruction, good old fashioned, in your face, listening, observing, providing feedback, small group instruction followed by sufficient collaborative practice for students work alone. So how do we make these additional shifts to implement evidence-based practices? Again, we must get informed and we must collaborate as a team. Many people think the collaboration and the standards is predominantly aimed at the students. Actually, it's aimed at the leadership, both administrators, teacher leaders, anyone that's having an impact on making decisions about the design, the curriculum choices, and the pacing uh, for taking students from where they are and being able to get them to the point that they can perform these outcomes. So one of the suggestions that I will um, make is go to the Gibson Hasbrook and Associates website, which is gha-pd.com, and download the big sheets, as I called them. What I did is I took the Common Core State Standards, which represents 85% of the content and 46 of the states, and most of those standards are also in Texas, Indiana, and Oklahoma. I took all of the state standards per grade level and put them one sheet of paper. It needs to be printed on 11 by 17 inch paper that you can download a page of directions that actually explains how to color code and have a in-depth discussion about these standards and their impact on teaching, student practice, assessment. And it is a wonderful resource that once you get it color coded that per grade level and we have them from English language arts from kindergarten through grade 12. 
and mathematics standards from kindergarten through grade eight. And what you're seeing here is a color-coded uh, copy they are representing the verb, which is the most important uh, word in a standard because it identifies the intensity of a teacher's instruction. In other words, whether the teacher is only responsible that year for introduction and provided early guided practice, or the teacher is responsible for providing practice with a lot of feedback, or the teacher is responsible for taking that skill to mastery with their students. That verb also identifies the level of outcome achievement for a student, whether they have to either practice it or demonstrate mastery. And then you're seeing blue, which is just the keywords, the noun or two or three keywords that would explain that standard. Where you're seeing the orange is where any standard that says with guidance and support, because that would indicate that as a teacher's responsibility to provide heavy leadership in that particular grade, grade level. So once you get your color, your standards color-coded color per grade level, then I encourage teams of teachers across the grade level to meet and have a discussion about how are you teaching that in kindergarten and first grade? Because if I'm a third grade teacher, the design of the standards based on learning progressions, what they're doing two years prior to me will have an impact on my student performance, my teaching out in third, fourth, and fifth. So it's to engage teachers and administrators in collaborative conversations about the development of these key skills or outcomes and standards across time. So it's a free resource and directions, as I said, are also available on the Gibson Hazard website. So one of the first things that I think that will help, as well as getting informed, is to establish classroom management routines and procedures that are common and consistently applied from grade to grade throughout the school district so that we develop actually a way of doing school. It saves two or three weeks every year that teachers are spending on reestablishing expectations and rules and uh, procedures for students. So number one, they all teachers and all grade levels should look at the speaking and listening standards for kindergarten. I believe that that's where everyone will have to go back to. I know few adults that can maintain a conversation, staying on the top under discussion, speaking in complete sentences, using correct subject verb agreement, and waiting for a turn to talk, and the kindergarten expectations, and following those rules for discussion, which we mean listening with attention, not interrupting, uh, basic good manners. So I think the first place of classroom management is to discussion across the grade levels, again, of what defines respectful communication, what's acceptable, what isn't acceptable, and what are the ways that we want to model and teach that and present that in our school. And then I, I think that I would suggest that you establish consistent routines from the moment a student walks into a classroom. There's a routine for putting away their belongings. There's a routine for them uh, getting their materials ready for the day. I'd like to suggest that everyone uses a business center, which is a bulletin board only about management, and this happens to be in some resources that I've written also on the Gibson and Hasbrook website. But we use a bulletin board that basically has a daily schedule, a rotation system with a rotation chart, and a job chart because we actually engage students in uh, jobs and responsibilities within classrooms. And those routines and procedures are consistently taught and applied and reinforced through the classroom. And so the students every year know exactly what the expectation is when they walk in a classroom. And most importantly, that you would use a rotation system to manage flexible grouping. Because differentiating instruction is critical. You want that homogeneous, similar skill grouping when they are working with the teacher in small group. But when students are in collaborative practice, they need to be in heterogeneous or mixed skill grouping. And that seems to be the difficulty. How do you manage that? And a rotation system can easily do that for a teacher. So as an administrator, 
walk into a classroom as a lead teacher, as a teacher, what is it that I want to see? I'd like to see the teachers using whole class opportunities to only provide an overview, not explicit instruction, because the variance amongst the students in that class is so great that you can't give explicit instruction with explicit feedback. And so providing just putting the puzzle outline of a puzzle, the pieces together, the two or three key ideas that you want to be teaching, let's say, that morning in English language arts or that afternoon, another whole class overview of the key ideas for either math or science or whatever you're teaching. So the teachers are teaching the students, or a group of students, in a smaller group. And in a smaller group, that could be eight to ten students. There is no evidence in the research that positively identifies what the number of students in a small group is. In fact, there was some research back uh, by uh, Shard and Sharon Vaughn that were looking at special ed populations that said, looking at the number of students per teacher, what would be most effective. And at the end of that three years of that study, it wasn't the size of the group, but the quality of the instruction and feedback that made a difference. So a small group, because it, it could be eight to 10 students, obviously you're grouping for the more, um, the kids that are working on or beyond grade level could be larger. Um, you're, um, focus group that, uh, that students that need more support could be smaller, but in a collaborative practice small grouping, I just try to make sure I have a good reader, a good writer, a kid that can draw or take dictation and take notes for the group, a good talker, and then whatever else that works in terms of behavioral compatibility. But the most important thing is that students receive instruction and feedback before they participate in collaborative practice, and then they are allowed to participate in multiple collaborative practice opportunities where they are encouraged to peer tutor, share their work, copy and teach each other, and it is not graded because that's the time that they are developing their understanding before they work in independently. So it would look like this with a table and then kids out in centers or collaborative practice, or it would look like this at an older student classroom, or like this at middle or high school. In most of 50 minute classes, they can only see two groups two times a week. But what we do is change the management of instruction and how it's delivered in classrooms and how students practice. So we look at classroom management, we teach students to collaborate, we teach students to uh, respectfully communicate, we teach teachers and work with our teachers and leaders so they collaborate and they're focused on the same goals, and then they begin to monitor the impact of the quality of their instruction, because good instruction is the best intervention if you want to increase student learning. And when we change to that model, the first things teachers report within two weeks everywhere that we've implemented this, a dramatic increase in student participation, a significant increase in behavioral problems because students know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, thanks to the rotation system, and they re received instruction that made sense and got their questions answered before they had to work independently. So I'm going to pass that back over to you now, uh, Kurt. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Vicki, uh, and Ron and Nancy as well uh, for all that great information. Vicki's made her uh, contact information available here, uh, as you see on your screen. And we're going to get to the Q&A portion here. Uh, first, a couple of reminders. We're getting uh, a lot of questions and comments, people asking about accessing the slides uh, and the recording. And yes, again, everyone who registered here will be getting a follow-up email uh, later on today a link to where you can access those slides. I know uh, we have kind of, uh, packed a lot of great information here into a short amount of time. So you'll have opportunity to take a look at those slides again uh, if you would like. And uh, another uh, quick reminder here, if you do have a question, please enter it in the Q&A box right-hand corner of your screen there. Uh, and thanks to everybody who has uh, submitted already. 
Uh, see, first question. Uh, we just have a few minutes left here, but um, uh, Ron, this uh, question came in uh, while you were speaking at the uh, at the beginning. We we're talking about uh, behavior management, uh, and someone asks. Uh, when looking at instructional procedures, where does the student ever own any of their learning? Has it been established that uh, they are manifested through disinterest, uh, frustration, et cetera? Uh, Ron, I think that uh, student ownership of learning play, plays an important part there in uh, behavior management or, or positive uh, actions with the teachers. Does that play a role? Let me address the second part of that question first, and then we'll go back to the other one. And, this, I don't know if I'll get it all real quickly, but we'll we'll, we'll try. Um, yes, yeah, so in the second part, the answer would be yes. That's why uh, if if I'm working with a student with severe behavior issues or issues, and I'm doing a functional behavioral assessment, I'm looking at uh, whether or not uh, instruction is playing a role. There's there's types of learners essentially. One is a learner who um, we call uh, the student can't do, and another student uh, won't do. So I'll do student. Typically, is more of a student who has the academic skills to do the behaviors, but they're more oppositional. That requires a different type of approach. The can't-do student, on the other hand, is a student who's frustrated, who may not be instructed at his or her particular instructional level. And in that case, then we want to start doing academic uh, functional assessments to find out what's going on academically with that student. So the similar the answer, or the question, the answer would be yes. Um, that, that can lead to behavior issues. The first part, I'm not sure of what it means to own any student learning. I have a, an assumption or a, a feeling you're probably going to intrinsic motivation. Um, that requires a long, drawn-out answer. A uh, short part of that is, um, I don't know what that is. Um, I've read all the research on it, and no one absolutely agrees on what that is. I believe it would be behaviors are occurring in the absence of any type of obvious environmental Effect. However, that also then doesn't take a look at things like schedules of reinforcement, where we may uh, perform behaviors in the absence of reinforcement. I experience individuals who look at students who own their own learning, um, where they are behaving and the student is quote unquote making their own choice to misbehave, that typically is a reason for using punishment based procedures. Um, the fact is that we're all motivated in some way. And when I make a point that positive reinforcement is not reward, I'm not talking rewards here. I can reinforce through positive reinforcement, which is simply the interaction of an individual with the environment. Whether or not there is an intermediary there, like a teacher, is secondary. So I can respond, and that change in my environment may lead to further changes in my behavior. That would be a positive reinforcer. So. I'm not sure how to answer that first part of the question without knowing more, but that, that would be my suspicion that we're probably looking at uh, intrinsic motivation, which is a very sticky topic and requires a lot more time than a few minutes. Okay. All right. Sure. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, let's see. Next question. This one came in uh, while you were presenting, Nancy, uh, so uh, I assume it's, it's for you. Uh, another kind of two-part question here saying, uh, there's often struggle with scaffolding and differentiation of core instruction at grade level standards. They struggle with pivoting instruction based on form of assessments. Do you have any suggestions there uh, to help with that? Uh, Nancy, does that uh, make sense? I have a two-part question there, but it seems to be asking about helping teachers uh, change instruction based on the results of assessment. Yeah, just thinking that it depends on the core program that's being used. I mean, there are certainly a lot of great core programs that have within them uh, guidelines on how to provide additional scaffolding or differentiation. I mean, I'm just thinking of Wonders as an example of certainly a great program that offers a lot of teacher tips and so forth. Um, also, additional materials that, that um, you can with a program like WonderWorks that are even more intentional that would help a teacher to be able to provide more intensive types of instruction. But if you have that with the core program that you're using, I'm, you know, I tend to look at 
several things in terms of like increasing student engagement, asking more questions, getting choral responses, firming responses if they're if students aren't saying it like they know it, um, making sure that your error correction procedures are intentional, where the kids um, what the answer is, and then have them repeat and do a starting over um, and lots of praise. So kind of those those ideas of instruction would be things that I would utilize it at the core level to make it more effective. Okay, sure, thank you. Um, uh, uh, let's see, we just have uh, about a minute left here, but uh, maybe one more for you, Nancy. Uh, just ask uh, why the controversy over explicit instruction and inquiry-based instruction? Uh, what, what's at the root there? Well, you know, some folks think that, you know, students love learning more if they can get in and, and um, struggle with it and be creative. And, um, He's sort of um, well known for showing a clip from the movie Footloose if you were with Kevin Bacon when he's teaching Chris Penn how to dance. And, you know, the whole notion that, you know, Kevin Bacon breaks, breaks dance down into teaching him rhythm and then modeling how to dance and sleep, removing himself. And as Chris Penn learns the moves, and at the end of the movie, you see Chris Penn dancing. He hasn't been taught all the moves that he started exhibiting, but he had the basics from which to move into more creative dance. And that's my point, that, you know, it's not a matter of if we use much more, you know, constructivist approaches or not, but when. And that would be when students have the skills to form at a certain level, then, of course, we're going to add more authentic and, you know, uh, more, um, in lack of a better word, authentic or, or student-centered kinds of approaches. That's the ultimate goal. But it depends on where students are at the time. Um, in terms of where we would start. Okay, uh, very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, it certainly looks like we've reached the uh, top of the hour here. Uh, I just want to be respectful of everybody's time here. On behalf of the administration, I'd like to thank our speakers once again, uh, Vicki, Nancy, and Ron. Thank you all so much for being with us and sharing your time and your expertise with us. And thank you again to our sponsor, McGraw-Hill, for their generous support uh, of our web seminar today. Also, of course, to everyone in our audience, thank you so much for joining us. I do hope you found our seminar discussion and presentation uh, interesting and useful to you. Bring events like this one is just part of our mission at DA to inform school district like leaders like you about the uh, latest news and trends K-12 management. You'll find more coverage about issues such as the ones we discussed here in the pages of our magazine, as well as on our website and our free daily e-newsletter, DA Daily. And before, for those of you who would like to share this event with your colleagues, or if you want to go back over presentation at your own pace, you can access it from our website by going to the URL on your screen here, where it will be put in the archive section in about 48 hours. And if you'd like to download the slides, you'll find instructions and link in a thank you email that you receive later on today. That's it for today's event. Once again, I'm Kurt Isley Durley for District Administration. I'm a producer, Ashley Morgan, and everyone on my production team. Good and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much for joining us.